Kicking off at number five, Willow Creek, 2013. Crazy. Pets and people go missing all the time. I'll go in there myself. You can just stay here in town if you want. You believe any nut job out there that says Sasquatch is real? And for our first brush with folklore in horror cinema, we're heading over to North America with perhaps one of the most legendary paranormal creatures and sources of forestry urban legend, Bigfoot. And while you may think that Bigfoot has historically been more miss than hit in horror cinema, this film definitely has something to say about that. Written and directed by Bobcat Goldthwait in his first ever foray into horror cinema, Willow Creek is your standard indie found footage handheld horror about Bigfoot law and is heavily influenced by the legendary Patterson Gimlin footage of 1967. However, while on the surface this film definitely doesn't do anything new and it doesn't exactly break any new ground for horror cinema, as we step through the woods of Northern California, the folklore of the Sasquatch and Bigfoot has never been more real. Willow Creek tells the tale of Jim and his long suffering girlfriend Kelly. Jim is a fanatic believer of Bigfoot law and an avid amateur cryptozoologist in pursuit of the big hairy unknown. In classic found footage fashion, Jim's idea of a romantic getaway is to head into the Six Rivers National Forest and hopefully find the infamous dry sandbar deep in the woods where the Patterson Gimlin footage was shot and film the whole thing along the way. It's a simple premise with a relatively simple interpretation of folklore. Bigfoot is just a giant hairy elusive humanoid that lives deep in the wild, right? Well, Willow Creek definitely believes that, but it has a lot more to say about the implications of the unknown. I'll say no more because whilst this film is short and straightforward in its approach, it also packs in so much more and expands upon an already intriguing folklore. Also, mark my words, the last few frames of this film will make your hair stand on end in some way or another. Coming in at number 4, Borgman, 23. For our next entry, we'll be heading over to the mysteries and dark fantasies of Germanic folklore. And whilst this film isn't exactly the most clear cut interpretation of a fairy tale, its mechanics are a much more modern description of an age old fear. 2013's Borgman isn't exactly the clearest or most obvious of horror films. In fact, in many ways, it's a film that relies on the psychology of fear to land its punches, but it's in the surrealism of this horror movie where things really get interesting. Written and directed by Dutch filmmaker Alex van Vormerdam, Borgman paints the intriguing picture of a mysterious homeless man that goes by many names throughout the film, but in all reality, he is none other than an Alp, the nightmare demon of Germanic folklore. In the oral traditions of Central European society, the old high German creature, the Alp, was likened to an often malevolent nature god or demon similar to that of a fawn that would later be morphed into the elves of Celtic and Scandinavian lore. In Borgman, this simple formula gets a much more modern retelling as the mysterious homeless man, otherwise known as Anton, gets chased out of his underground home deep in the wilderness by a priest and two armed men where he seeks refuge in a wealthy family's home. And then, as we expect, things take a much more mystical turn. I won't say any more because Borgman is a surprisingly shocking film and the final act of this movie is pure evil. It's almost like Michael Haneke's funny games just with an ancient Germanic Alp in Instead, and that's what makes it great. Next up at number three, Little Otik. And where the hell do I even begin with this film? I know I say that a lot, but perhaps the most fitting example of that phrase is this film. Way back in the day when I was taking film class at college, we were studying European surrealism, and this film just so happened to rock up one day on my watch list. And still to this day, I think back at how utterly messed up it is. But don't get me wrong, this film isn't messed up in the sense of, say, a Serbian film. This film is messed up because it's just so strangely weird, bizarre, not quite like any think you've ever seen or will see. It's not even a horror film. In fact, it's pretty damn hilarious in places, but trust me, Little Otik is a horror experience. Written and directed by the legendary surrealist Jan Svankmeyer, Little Otik is a Czech film based upon the Otisanic fairy tale from 19th century Czechoslovakia. And what's that, you may ask? Well, Otisanya is a dark European cautionary folk tale about a couple that have been struggling to conceive a child together. One day out in the fields, the husband finds a strange log of wood that curiously resembles the figure of a baby, and so he decides to bring it home to his wife. The couple are completely overjoyed by their new wooden child and suddenly that log baby comes to life and demands to be fed. But then as time passes the baby can't stop eating and Otisanyek gets hungrier and hungrier and you can see where this is going, right? Little Otik is incredibly straightforward with its narrative but Jan Svankmeyer manages to squeeze every last terrifying and intriguing drop out of this fairy tale. He blends strange twisted stop motion animation with live action set pieces and this film really is a feast for your eyes. Although it isn't a traditional horror film so to speak. If you haven't seen Little Otik, please do, because you won't be forgetting it in a hurry. Swinging in at number two, November 2017. <laughs> 
Dimas Lombok's Yamin Darmastak's. This film is beautiful and sick and twisted and brilliant and everything you could ever want from a horror fantasy based on folklore because it's a hodgepodge of all of those things woven beautifully in those same surreal dark tones of northern Europe. This film shot way way under the radar and admittedly it may be a little too art house for some people but forget about that because visually speaking from a horror perspective this film is worth so much. There's nothing like it, it's exciting and it's brilliant and films like this as well as Robert Eggers The Witch are important and entries into both folklore and horror cinema. Written and directed by Raina Sarnet, November is an Estonian dark fantasy horror based upon the novel Rehepap Ek November by Andrus Kirivak, which is essentially a modern grim fairy tale about the price of young love and the dangers that come with it. Aren't they all, eh? Set in a small 19th century village in Estonia that is unwittingly besieged by every magical creature in the forest, spirits, wood elves, trolls, gnolls, and even the devil himself, the folklore elements of November are juxtaposed by a very real historical reality. You see, the town is also besieged by the Black Death, the plague, and the church are trying their utmost to save some souls. Behind that though is the backdrop of a young love triangle trying their best to circumvent each other's heart's desires in the classic cautionary fashion that we all expect. I don't say this lightly, but this film is Shakespearean. There's so much calamity going on that it's almost like a horror depiction of A Midsummer Night's Dream, and it lends itself perfectly to the ingenuity of Baltic folklore and literature. Despite that though, November also crams in all the dirt, grime, and the very physical gore of pain and existence out in the rural mire of 19th century Europe and that alone makes it worth a watch. This film is brilliant. Give it a watch. And finally coming in at our number one spot, Sauna 2008. Let me preface this with a very important point. This film is hella messed up, and you will either love this film or you will hate it. It's as simple as that. But the reason this film takes our number one spot, despite me being a massive fan of it, is down to its no-nonsense approach to the stark realities of folklore and the price of human life that is often paid in its cautionary tales. 2008 Sauna does not pull any punches. It doesn't sugarcoat the realities of death with the magical or mystical, and because of that, it's perhaps one of the starkest interpretations of myth and legend of recent times. Sauna, otherwise known as Filth or Evil Rising, in its English release tells the tale of two brothers in Finland in 1595. It takes place at the end of the bloody Russo-Swedish war and the brothers, one of them a violent and grizzled warrior and the other a kind and timid scholar, are tasked with marking the new border between Finland and Russia. So what does a sauna have to do with it? Well, I'll leave that for you all to discover because part of the appeal of this film is pulling at the thread of its mystery. But heading into this film, you may need to know, although it may not seem like it, the folklore connotations of one of Scandinavia's most ancient pastimes, the steamed hut and hovels of a sauna play a very significant and horrifying role in this film. There are so many tales throughout Finnish folklore about the dangers of meeting mischievous figures behind the ancient myths of a sauna, but this film is instead concerned with its surprising spiritual connection and the role it played in the cleansing of sins. You may have to dig deep into this film to truly understand its significance to folklore, but put it this way, the Sami people of northern Finland were one of the last bastions of ancient paganism and remained unconverted by Christianity until the 18th century. Keep that thought in your head and then watch this film. I'll say no more. Kicking off at number five, Tole 2012. Now, some of you may pronounce this film Thail, which is fine. I mean, it's toilet, but whatever. Say what you want. Okay, let's get this out of the way first and foremost. This film is low budget, like really, really low budget, as in $10,000 low budget. And that may perhaps detract from a few people's enjoyment of this film, because for the most part, you can tell that this film is low budget. There's no hiding it. But to hell with that, because even with the scratchy CGI, this film is perhaps the literal definition of folklore in horror cinema, focusing on one of Scandinavia's most legendary forest creatures, Features, the Hulda, which are essentially the same sirens and succubi of Greek and Eastern mythology, encapsulated in this case as the legendary spirits of the wild woodlands of Norway. And while this film has a particularly bold premise, the magic of it comes with how much focus there is on the smaller details of the magical and the horrifying price that comes with meddling in such an ancient power. Written and directed by Alexander Nordas in his feature film debut, Tarlet tells the tale of two guys, Alvis and Leo, who are down on their luck but struggle to make ends meet by running a 
crime scene cleanup business. And one particularly gruesome job, they discover a strange, oddly humanoid creature hidden in a basement. A girl named Torla, who despite the mystical nature of her being, has been imprisoned against her will and then subject to vile medical experiments and torture. Yeah, pretty bold premise, right? But that's what makes this film awesome. It's brave enough to essentially take what should be a found footage idea and slam it together with a fly on the wall approach to folklore in horror. This film isn't perfect by any means, but it stands on its own as one of the truest depictions of what horror can do when it picks apart the threads of cultural lore. Give it a watch. Coming in at number four, Under the Shadow, 2016. And let's preface this with the fact that this film is bleak. Really, really bleak. But also on the flip side to that coin, also strangely mystifying and alluring in ways that only the supernatural folklore and mythologies of the Middle East can be. And for those of you with Netflix, it's pretty much available to stream in every country, so you have no excuse to not watch this film, really. And also, whilst this film received a fickle appraisal service of a vast host of film critics, a fact that will oftentimes put some people off, it really does live up to its hype. And 2016's Under the Shadow does something with the horror genre that many films fail to do. It made itself historically relevant without once sacrificing any portion of its narrative to do so. It's seamless, and because of that, this film hits relentlessly hard on many different levels carving its own place in the landscape of horror fiction, yet sitting beside films such as Jennifer Kent's The Babadook, as well as her 2018 film The Nightingale, two films that may give you a sense of the tone to Under the Shadow. Written and directed by Babak Anvari, Under the Shadow tells a tale of a mother, Shida, and her daughter, Corsa, who are caught amidst the final year of the Iran-Iraq war that ravaged throughout the late 1980s, and find themselves sheltered in their apartment building in Tehran, as the Iraqi army shell the city with bombs and mortar fire, and her neighbouring residents slowly disappear amidst the chaos. Shide stands defiant though whilst her husband, a doctor who has been drafted to the front line, pleads for her to leave. I won't say any more because part of the terrifying magic of this film comes with discovering the deep-rooted cautionary tale of its lore, but let me put it this way. Under the Shadow doesn't rely on jump scares to hit hard with its horror. In fact, its most unsettling scene involves a toy doll, but start to finish this film is eerie in ways not often found in cinema. This film comes from a dark place and it offers an unrelenting insight into the horrors found in the hearts of men and monsters alike. Next up at number three, Rare Exports, 2010. We are standing on the biggest burial mound in the world. I know how that is. Which is perhaps a film a little bit lighter in tone, but please don't let its otherwise jolly appearance fool you, because this film has more blood, guts, and naked ice elf whites than you may first imagine. And you may be a little perturbed at the fact that what is essentially a Christmas film finds its way upon our list, but if you know anything about the true tale behind Santa Claus, you'll know that there is quite a hell of a lot to be scared of. And of course, what better place to encapsulate the dread-inducing folklore of Satan Claus himself than the weird and wonderful place place known only as Finland, Mita Helvet. But really, we have to highlight the fact that Finland is an incredibly unique place and is perhaps the only country and culture that could have ever created this film. And we're all the better off because of it. If you've never seen Rare Exports, please don't wait for Christmas to roll around because it's worth a watch any time of the year. Written and directed by Yalmari Helander, Rare Exports, A Christmas Tale tells its story in one part English and one part Finnish language, serving as a neat little filter before descending fully into the unabashed idiosyncrasies of Northern Lapland. It focuses on a British research team and a local family of reindeer herders who unassumingly release an ancient fell, a long forgotten burial mound built by the Sami people over centuries as a means to imprison a malevolent creature, a horned being that whips misbehaving children and then boils them in a cauldron one day every year. And yeah, that horrifying horned creature, of course, is Santa Claus. But listen, despite its ridiculous premise, rare exports lays on the folklore of Finland so seamlessly that you can't help but go along with his breakneck horror goodness as Pitari and his father try and cling to life on a day that's meant for rest and celebration. Yeah, trust me, Rare Exports is a film like no other and it's a horror experience of pure folklore. Swinging in at number two, The Ritual 2017. Let's 
And you may sense a little bit of a theme within our final two entries, but what the hell, there's a lot of dread inducing folklore to be found here, and it's probably in our best interest to highlight the hallowed, horrifying halls of Scandinavian cultural mythology in order to do so. The Ritual is an awesome film, which strangely enough kind of got torn apart by a few critics, but forget about that, because if you were fans of Neil Marshall's The Descent, then you'll 100% be a fan of this film, which is claustrophobic in all the right ways, as well as being oddly reminiscent of dog soldiers just without the werewolves and instead replaced with the many beasts and fanatical worshippers of Nordic mythology. Now, don't get me wrong, this film isn't perfect, and in many ways it takes its sweet time to get going, but once it does, it's a folklore ride that is very much worth the wait. Directed by David Bruckner and based upon the novel of the same name by Adam Neville, the ritual tells a tale of four friends that met at university, Phil, Dom, Hutch, and Luke, who, after following the tragic death of one of their friends, decide to kickstart the grieving process by hiking through the Kungsleden, also known as the King. King's Trail in Sarek National Park of Northern Sweden, a place that their friend had always wanted to visit before his untimely death. And come on, you know where this is going, right? It's a horror film. But what begins as an archetypal frightful foray into the dark, wooded places of the world, it quickly shifts gears about halfway through, and the actual terrors that lurk within the forest are of a much more horrifying design than what we're accustomed to. The British folk revival is an exciting new look at horror, blending tales of the old with the new, and although the ritual has been somewhat overlooked by the subgenre down to its release director Netflix, it definitely deserves its place on this list. Give it a watch, you won't be disappointed. And finally coming in at our number one spot, Troll Hunter 2010. I, for one, absolutely adore this film, and whilst it may not be the most explicit depiction of horror, when it comes to a modern interpretation of folklore and the mythological monstrosities that come with it, 2010's Troll Hunter is second to none. And it's one that leaves its mark by in no way shying away from the mystical and the magical, but instead embracing it so fully and tightly that it's in danger of ripping its own arms off. Like, uh, well like a giant troll. Despite being a film that probably wouldn't have been made without the reverence of folklore and the actual joy of gradually unwinding its narrative through a handheld camera, the quality of the craft behind Troll Hunter catapults it entirely into a league of its own. It's brilliant, and if you've ever been told to watch Troll Hunter, but for some reason didn't, give it another look. Written and directed by Andre Ovredal, who would go on to create the fantastic 2016 horror The Autopsy of Jane Doe, and is built to tackle 2019's scary stories to tell in the dark, which as a side note is going to be equally awesome. Troll Hunter it tells a tale of a group of students from Volda University College as they head to the remote regions of northern Norway in pursuit of a series of alleged poachers who are hunting bears illegally in the wild. Well, soon of course the students realise that it's not exactly bears that they should be searching for, but instead a colony of ravenous trolls, a race of mythical monstrosities known as the Jotun, the terrifying creatures that were allegedly defeated by Thor himself in the canon of Nordic mythology, but of course he must have missed a few. This film is so much fun that it's worth watching just for the thrill ride. Yeah, it may not be full frontal horror, and it's definitely a film that couldn't have been made in any other way than found footage, but when it comes to folklore, this film is exactly what it says on the tin. It's wholeheartedly Nordic, it exemplifies the folklore traditions of Norwegian culture by thrusting its canon into the heart of modernity, and when it comes to this list, it definitely deserves our number one spot. Give it a watch. Kicking off at number five, The Hole in the Ground, 2019. Yes? Have you been going anywhere else? No. Like the forest, maybe? Yeah, perhaps one of the most intriguing indie films of the year so far, and who better to pick it up and distribute it than A24, the studio that consistently seems to be knocking it out of the park when it comes to originality in horror, who undoubtedly know a creepy tale when they see one. Written and directed by Lee Cronin in his debut feature film, The Hole in the Ground is a film that covers many themes, mainly being the stress of parenthood and the many trials and tribulations that come with raising a child on your own, but more importantly, it's sprinkled heavily with an incredibly vivid and key aspect of Irish folklore, which is that of the changeling, and the old Irish legend of the sinkhole often found out in the woods, a symbol of something far more sinister than what it first may seem. Now although that's probably quite a bit of plot revelation, it's also obviously the name of the film, and we can't really talk about its relation to folklore without touching on the significance of what it actually entails, but trust me, that's all I'll say about the plot. But also, don't worry about that, because start to finish, this film expertly manages to pack in so much substance into its 
90 minute runtime, and there's a bucket load of slow, creepy paranoia and deeply unsettling tones of the wilderness to chew upon. There is a lot to be found in this film, and surprisingly so, that's what makes it highly enjoyable. Part and parcel of the hole in the ground is trying to juggle exactly what's going on as we gradually attempt to unwind the many layers and myths of Irish folklore and their significance to the modern era. Yeah, as far as Irish folklore goes, this one sits right beside some of the best. Coming in at number four, Air Mentari, 2017. And although Spanish cinema often interweaves the magical and mystical aspects of folklore into pretty much all of their cinematic canon, with films like The Orphanage, The Devil's Backbone, and Pan's Labyrinth leading the charge in modern cinema, Ermentari, also known as The Blacksmith and the Devil, is perhaps one of the most vivid portrayals of European folklore in recent times. And it focuses entirely on what is essentially one of the oldest fairy tales of all time, The Smith and the Devil, with this film portraying its folklore version from the Basque region of Spain and France. If you you've heard that tale before, one that can be found in all corners of Europe from Russia to Germany, Greece and Italy, then you'll know exactly what it entails, but if not, then I'll keep shtum and let you discover it for yourself. From a technical perspective, Ermentari is an absolutely beautiful film and both its practical and digital effects manage to vividly paint the picture of the eternal magical mystery of European folklore and the ancient customs and cultures that are held within it. If anything, this film is remarkably important in that it accurately manages to tell a folktale without once becoming bored boring, or even more importantly, it never misses the point. In many ways, it's a period piece. In others, it's a film that holds itself eternal with the mysticism of its narrative. And it captures that same charm of being told a fairy tale when we were kids. Although, on the flip side to that, that same magic means this film isn't entirely terrifying. Trust me, you won't be screaming into your hands and shuddering with fear. And for fans of more explicit horror, Ermentari may miss the mark in several ways. But please, don't let that put you off. Because for fans of folklore and the cautionary tales of European culture, this film is one of a kind, and there should be more like it. Also, it's on Netflix, so give it a watch. Next up at number three, Wakewood, 2000. A surprising entry of the last decade, and much like our number five spot on this list, one of the most vivid depictions of Irish folklore, and yet one that is also threaded with the ancient customs and allegories of pagan mysticism to pin its bones down in a bizarre, ritualistic manner, more akin to the likes of 1973's The Wicker Man, more so than anything. Oh yeah, and also, this film stars Peter Baelish himself, Aidan Gillen, and don't worry, there's no dodgy accent in this film, and Gillen manages to knock 2009's Wake out of the park as the not quite sure what to do but just trying to keep my family apart kind of father alongside Eva Berthistle as his wife Louise. Written and directed by David Keating, Wakewood tells the tale of Patrick and Louise Daly whose young daughter Alice is savagely and tragically killed by a dog during the film's opening events. Distraught and grieving, the couple move to the remote rural village of Wakewood where they seek peace and quiet in the hope of finally coming to terms with their daughter's death. But of course, hell no, this is a horror movie and Patrick and Louise quickly become confronted by their own grief in the discovery that the village of Wakewood is of course home to a strange and secretive sect of pagan practitioners and the couple very swiftly understand the meaning of being very careful in what you wish for. I'll say no more about the film's plot but trust me, for a film produced by the legends of horror, Hammer, who traditionally speaking are notorious for not exactly having the most substantial of narratives but recently their studio revival has been knocking it out of the park and because of that there is a boatload of depth to be found in this film. 2009's Wakewood is tough to handle, and although it's low budget, it's pretty telling on some occasions. For the most part, the themes that it covers, folklore or otherwise, are particularly hard hitting. Yeah, give this one a watch. Swinging in at number two, Witchfinder General, 1968. Oh, come on, help me. Vincent. Price, the man, the myth, the undoubted legend of cinema, who secured his eternal horror credentials with his absolutely bone-chilling performance as Matthew Hopkins, the Witchfinder General himself, in a time where both folklore and the malign nature of superstition in English history came to their most prominent forefront. And our reverence for Mr. Price aside, 1968's Witchfinder General, also known as The Conqueror Worm, is one of the most important horror films in British folk cinema, where it vividly portrays the infamous, murderous, witch-hunting exploits of Matthew Hopkins, a 17th century English lawyer who claimed to have been appointed as the Witchfinder General by Parliament 
Parliament during the English Civil War. Hopkins claimed that he was appointed to root out sorcery and witchcraft, where he took advantage of the superstitious nature and misaligned fear of the East Anglian locals, to pretty grisly effect. I mean, that historical notion in itself forms an absolutely huge part of British folklore, and the atrocities committed by Hopkins are the stuff of cultural cautionary legend. But the reason that it makes its way onto our list is purely for the fact, in terms of folklore, Witchfinder General is one of the most brutal and genuinely unnerving films of the genre. I mean, granted, it's not as outwardly magical and mystical as many of the other films of this list, but trust me, the historical credentials are there. Written and directed by Michael Reeves, based upon the 1966 novel of the same name by Ronald Bassett, Witchfinder General embodies the essence of British folk horror. There are no good guys, there is no omnipotent force that is ready and waiting to save the day. There is only pain and misery, a misguided superstition that drives humanity toward it. Yeah, in terms of cautionary tales, this one is near the top of the pile, and it makes for some legendary horror cinema. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, Ravenous, 1999. Oh, I'm sorry. After you. I absolutely adore this film, and truth be told, I've been looking for a reason to feature some North American folklore on this list, and what better way to do so than with one of the most disgustingly underrated horror movies of the 20th century, 1999's Ravenous. This film is so damn good, and the fact that it still gets disregarded by critics to this day is a travesty. But forget about them, because if you're in the mood for some North American folklore horror set in the mid-1800s, pinned down by the native myth of the Wendigo and the cultural taboo of cannibalism that comes with it, then Ravenous is exactly what the doctor ordered. Just please, don't eat the stew. From a historical perspective, the folklore of this film is wrapped up in some truly bleak accounts of American and European culture, mainly being the horror of the Donna Reed party, as well as the legend of Sawney Bean, the monstrous cannibal of 16th century Scotland. Put it this way, it's somewhere between the two. Directed by Antonio Bird and written by Ted Griffin, Ravenous tells a tale of Lieutenant John Boyd, a man who is promoted to captain by dubious means during the Mexican-American War and is sent to Fort Spencer, a remote military outpost high in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Here, after succumbing to the bleak inhospitality of the region, a mysterious stranger emerges who has word of a particularly terrifying tale. I won't say any more because although this film is pretty telling in its folklore nature, the actual delivery of its narrative is a horror experience to be held. And even as it descends into pure gore and grotesque madness, it still manages to maintain its many textures of storytelling, albeit ones that are bleak and horrifying. Also, the cast of this film is absolutely absolutely stacked, and it's tantamount to late 90s cinematic greatness. Guy Pearce, Robert Carlyle, the late John Spencer, David Arquette, Jeremy Davis. Yeah, there's a lot to be found in Ravenous. It's a fantastic depiction of North American folklore, capturing the historical misery and isolation of the period, and it's a straight up horror gem that deserves a watch. First up, Ivor Clausen says, Jack, Thomas Jane is always awesome. Mutant Chronicles, hold my beer. Alright, alright, I get your point, but we can't always knock them out of the park. Sometimes you just have a bad day. Mutant Chronicles was terrible, but Thomas Jane was still awesome because he's always awesome. And finally, Pop Culture Psychology says, Jack, never stop the dad jokes. On behalf of all dads who share a love of horror movies with their kids, it's something for us too. Well, Pop Culture Psychology, I think this may just be my favorite comment in a long, long time. Thank you very much. I'm still trying to master the true art of the dad joke, but hopefully I can learn from some of the best. First up, Radical Fred 1969 says, Love you, Jack. You're my second favorite host after the Rebecca Falgate slash Lucy McPhee tie. You're just not as cute as them. I always take notes when watching your videos. You've introduced me to so many great movies. Thank you. Well, first the worst, second the best, third the one with the hairy chest. So yeah, in that case, I'll take second place happily. Just kidding, of course, but thank you very much for the kind words. Cheers. Next up, Mr. Reasonable says, what about the golem? Well, I actually haven't seen the golem yet, and to be honest, I was kind of put off by the trailer, but hey, you know how the old saying goes, don't judge a movie by its trailer. I'll make sure to give a watch, and who knows, maybe it'll make our part Three. First up, Kronesh Lilith says, what is your least favourite horror remake? Ah, sadly, an easy one, because I try not to hate too much on remakes, but it definitely has to be Psycho by Gus Van Sant. Mainly because I love Gus Van Sant, and mainly because I also love Vince Vaughn, and that film just 
kind of wasn't a thing that ever, ever needed to be made. Yeah, that's my pick. And finally, Zulfa says, Jack, do you have some connection to Scandinavia? And what's your favourite Scandinavian horror flick? Well, Zulfa, I'm 11% Norwegian, but my main connection to Scandinavia is probably the fact that I used to raid with a guild of Swedes, Danes, and Norwegians back in the day when I did play World of Warcraft, which I'm not ashamed to admit. Hey there, it's Bjorn. As for my favourite Scandinavian horror flick, it's got to be Let the Right One In. That film is insurmountable. <laughs>